Hey everyone, welcome to this video, which is a guide to thinking in chess. So I wanted to make this video because I haven't found an online resource that really covers um, like how to think in chess, um, the different methods you could use, um, and the different aspects uh, of the game itself. Because in the beginning, it may seem very overwhelming that, you know, how do these strong players see everything, it seems. But actually, there are a lot of uh, different ways that uh, players use to be able to make things a lot easier because of because we are trying to find like the best move uh, in every position um, but we need to have like an algorithm an algorithm let's say or a strategy to try to find these best moves um, and so yeah I'm going to be covering a lot of things in this video uh, which is not just limited to like strategies and thinking I will also direct you in a way of how to improve um, things you can work on um, for the next um, yeah, I mean, basically till the end of your chess career, because we will never perfect uh, any aspect of our game, but we can get, you know, pretty good at it. So, yeah, I'm going to be covering um, these four main things. Uh, the first one are the opening principles, uh, of which there are seven. Um, the second one, are, uh, the second thing is the exception to these principles um, with concrete examples to follow after this presentation, which I will show on the chessboard. Um, and the third one is how to think in the opening and middle game. So different strategies to try to see which variation is the best um, and also different theories in um, chess thinking, uh, which I will cover. Um, it's uh, So there are just two like theories that I'm going to mention, which is first off Alexander Kotov's uh, tree of analysis and um, a quick scan method, which was um, referenced or mentioned by uh, John Nunn in his book, uh, Secrets of Practical Chess. Um, yeah, I'm sure there are a lot more like theories um, ar around, but these two I found to be like the most useful. Um, and we'll just look at those, um, yeah, in the third, sec in the third section. Um, and the last thing are a few important things to understand. Uh, so what you can improve uh, on, for example, evaluation, um, calculation, um, end games and everything like that. I will just mention briefly, um, as well as uh, other material. Other material you can read after this presentation. Um, so yeah, first are the opening principles. Uh, so there are going to be two slides uh, of this section, and the first principle is to control the center. So the central squares uh, are the uh, four squares in the middle of the board, which are the squares e4, uh, d4, e5, and d5. So most of the action happens in this, uh, yeah, in this uh, four central squares. And so in principle, we want to take control over, this, over the center, which is why the first, uh, the two like most common first moves are pawn to e4. So advancing the king pawn forward, uh, two squares and pawn to d4. Um, and it really is up to preference, like your personal preference of what openings you like to play um, as white, um, and so, yeah, like it really depends. Uh, there's no like better first move, let's say. Um, it really depends on your preference. There are also other moves, for example, pawn to c4, which is known as the English opening, which indirectly controls the center because pawns capture diagonally. And so it controls the center in that way. Also, like for example, uh, the first move knight f3 also makes sense because the knight develops and uh, takes control over the central squares uh, while keeping flexibility of the pawns. Because once you move a pawn forward, it cannot come back. And so um, this is especially important in the middle and end game uh, where pawns can advance forward. But we, if we advance them too far, then they can be weaknesses and, and actually a liability. Um, and so, yeah, we should, uh, in general, like take control of the center. Um, second, the second principle is to develop all of your pieces. So in general, we want to develop knights first and then bishops. And only then do we castle our king to get our king to safety. And then finally, we can develop our queen and the rooks. Um, and so the reason that this is uh, this development scheme uh, follows as such is because we know generally where our knight wants to go. Normally, our knight is best um, aimed at the center. Uh, for example, if we look at uh, again at the board, the knight, like, you know, 90% of the time wants to go to f3 or even like 99% of the time wants to go to f3 because it controls the center. Um, and so the knight moving to e2 doesn't make much sense. And so we always, since we always know that the knight wants to go to f3, 
we can play it um, very quickly uh, without much thought. Meanwhile, the bishop on f1, it may want to go to c4 or it may want to go to b5, let's say. So, you know, you can still keep a bit of flexibility there. Meanwhile, the knight um, is more fixed uh, in the sense that you know where it wants to go. Um, and then uh, the third principle is to secure the king. Uh, so this is what I mentioned with castling before. So basically, our king and our rook can switch uh, positions uh, where our king moves two squares to, to the right side or to the left side, depending if we want to castle uh, on the king side of the board or the queen side. So what am I talking about? Um, so basically, the board is divided into two parts. The queen side, which is the uh, first four uh, columns, um, or we call them files in chess. Uh, the first four files, uh, because that's where the queen initially uh, is located, like on this side of the board. Meanwhile, the uh, four files on the right uh, are known as the king side. Uh, and so uh, when we're deciding which side to castle, uh, we also need to consider where our opponent is going to castle. So if our opponent castles, um, if we castle on the same side as our opponent, then this generally this generally leads to more strategic play uh, without much like, you know, aggressive attacking chess going on. Um, of course, there are exceptions to this, but in general, um, this is what happens. Meanwhile, uh, if we castle on the opposite sides of the board, uh, then this leads to very aggressive play because, because okay, so basically, uh, because we want to secure our king, right? Uh, if we castle on one side of the board, and let's say we castle on the king side of the board, we really don't want to be moving too many pawns on this side of the board because these pawns act as a shield to our king because we're castled on, on that side, right? And so uh, our flexibility of pawns really um, uh, are available on the queen side because our king, our king isn't on the king's, uh, on the queen side. And so we can move those pawns forward without thinking that, oh, is my king going to be under fire, let's say. Um, and so if we castle on the opposite side of the board, let's say we white castles king side and black castles queen side, then uh, both sides are gonna try to push their pawns forward to try to attack the enemy king and thus, this leads to more attacking play. Uh, an example of this is in the Sicilian Dragon, where uh, white castles um, long or castles queenside, while black castles short or castles kingside. So yeah, that's basically um, the third principle. And the next one is to not make too many is to not make too many useless pawn moves in the opening. So what we'll often see in beginners is that they make a lot of pawn moves like flank pawns we call them so the pawn on the a file or the pawn on the h file now normally uh beginners like to play this because they're afraid of a bishop occupying a square for example if white plays the pawn to h3 um oftentimes beginners think that oh i don't want my knight on f3 to get pinned uh with a with the black bishop coming to g4 um and so they play h3 just more out of fear rather than a specific purpose um and so there are like moves uh, in the opening um, where we actually make pawn moves for the sake of our strategic um, plans going forward. But it's important to understand that this is not made out of fear. Uh, it's the moment that you make these pawn moves out of fear that um, oftentimes these, uh, this is a mistake um, because you can create many weaknesses and more importantly, you're wasting time because if a pawn move doesn't really contribute to your strategic goal, or um, your development, for example, then what is it doing other than, you know, wasting time and possibly creating weaknesses? Um, and the next principle is to not develop the queen out too quickly. So, an, uh, like a very common example is the, um, is a scholar's mate uh, where, you know, white tries to go for the um, four move checkmate with the queen coming to h5, bishop coming to c4, but this never really like works out too well um, because, um, yeah, like the queen, it's the most powerful piece in that it can threaten so much, but it's also the most vulnerable in the sense that if it's attacked, it has to move. And so we don't want to bring our queen out too early because if your opponent can attack it and let's say, let's say for example, they can develop with a tempo uh, attacking our queen. So a tempo is basically a gain of time. Um, then we don't really accomplish much by bringing the queen out of, uh, you know, out so early. And so we want to be kind of conservative when developing our queen. Um, yeah, that's in general. Um, and yeah, this relates to next to the next principle, which is to not move the same piece twice in the opening, f for the same reason that it wastes time that we could be use that we could be using this uh, to develop, uh, or you know, just forwarding our strategic uh, goals. Um, 
yeah, and basically the last principle is to aim your pieces towards the center because most of our battle occurs in the center. And so we have a common saying in chess, which is the knight on the rim is is dim or is it the knight on the rim is grim. Either way, it's it just shows that um, the knight, if it goes to the side of the board, it really doesn't contribute much to the action. And so we want to be very careful about uh, developing our knight to the side of the board or where it can just be inactive or even even worse if it's vulnerable there and uh, yeah, vulnerable to attack, let's say. Um, so yeah, uh, well, we're going to be discussing the exceptions to the principles, um, but I'm going to be mainly looking at uh, these exceptions uh, on the chessboard because it doesn't really um, help you, I feel like, uh, if you're like maybe more of a beginner. Uh, if I just mention the opening names, but don't actually show them on the board, because like, what are these openings? Um, you know. So, first, the first principle: control the center. Um, there is actually a modern idea uh, where one side, let's say black, most often black does it, uh, that black allows white to uh, to occupy the center, and they will put pawn, uh, they will undermine these uh, central pawns with. Um, with pawns to try to attack the center uh, in the hopes that the center is actually vulnerable to attack. Uh, an example of this is in the modern defenses, such as the Grunfeld defense, uh, the modern defense, um, and for example, the Nimzo Larsen, which is 1b3. Um, yeah, uh, and the second principle uh, is to develop all your pieces. I would say that um, most of the time you should be following this principle, uh, especially if you're a beginner, because you want to develop your pieces and most of the time your opponent isn't like um, doing anything special in the opening either. And so you really want to just develop your pieces, get your king to safety and uh, don't even think twice about that. However, um, there are certain openings where uh, there are certain threats created. Um, and so we need to be able to deal with that, right? Um, and so we can't just play our normal development if our opponent does something funky and tries to uh, imbalance the position early from the opening. Um, and also, if our opponent opponents are threatening something, then we obviously uh, can't just like think about developing and like not, uh, you know, consider our opponent's uh, threat. And so that's very important. Um, and an example of this is in the, in the Scotch game, which we will examine later. And the third principle is to secure the king. And so in general, we want to castle as fast as possible, but in the rare case, there may be some times where, according to theory and certain variations, the king is actually safest in the center. Um, it's quite rare, but there are very specific scenarios where this is the case, um, especially if the pawn structure demands it. Um, I actually had a game like very recently, so like just, I think two days ago, um, where my king actually is, is stuck in the center, but it's actually already a significantly better position um, because like um, because of the, the other positional factors. For example, if your opponent's pieces are more passive, uh, if there is no possibility of your king getting under fire, all of those factors need to be uh, yeah in consideration. Um, and the next principle is to not make too many pawn moves in the opening. Uh, as I mentioned before, certain openings have um, like certain openings have pawn moves included in them. Um, where it has a specific idea in mind and it isn't played out of fear but rather played with a specific subtlety in mind. An example of this happening is in the um, Italian game where a, uh, there's a lot of move order trickery uh, which we call it where um, if we move a flank pawn on the side um, black should respond in a certain way um, and yeah this occurs a lot in the Italian which I will just cover a bit later. Um, and the next principle is to not develop the queen out too quickly. Uh, in general, I would say that this is actually true, but in, an exception to this is the Scandinavian defense, uh, which in itself isn't a great opening. I think that white has very nice lines against it, which I will talk about later. Um, but it's possible that after the, pawn, the moves e4, black responds with d5. And after we take the pawn, the queen, the black queen develops like very early. And it's, it is vulnerable to attack, but it has, uh, you know, a wide variety of options to uh, possibly um, just activate the queen without getting into, uh, about, without wasting too much time and without getting into too much danger, let's say. Um, and the next principle is to not move the same piece twice in the opening. So if we're threatening something that cannot be defended, 
then this is not then this does not make the principle because even though we're moving the same piece twice it's just winning material and material is when we gain like for example a pawn or even more than that and yeah, if we attack something that cannot be defended then we're just going to be winning like there is no other consideration um if it is you know that crystal clear um and according to opening theory this yeah this uh, principle can be also be broken uh, for example in the famous fried liver attack um it's a very possible variation in the Italian game uh, to occur, um, but both sides need to know what they're doing uh, because it's very specific and move by move. Uh, and the last principle is to aim your piece towards pieces to the center. Um, the exception to this is, is if there are better and more ideal squares for the piece, uh, but this rarely happens because most of the time our pieces want to be controlling the central squares. But I will show you an example actually where the uh, a very uh, innovative idea where the knight can actually land on the side with the intention to go to a better square in the center. So again, it's always, the focus is always on the center, but if the knight has another route um, in which a, a square is like uh, also controlling the center, but it's just like just a better square. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain this, but essentially um, we should also look at where our pieces are the happiest at. Um, and we shouldn't just um, basically uh, autopilot it too much, autopilot our development too much. We should always consider like where our pieces are best placed at. Um, so yeah, we're going to get to the juicy parts uh, in this section, which is how to think. Um, so yeah, uh, the first principle, the first uh, like recommendation I can give you is to focus on the opening principles. I would say that to the like 1400 or even 1500 level, um, you should always focus in, focus on opening principles, hammer these down uh, so you got them like in the back of your mind, you don't even need to think twice. Um, and once you get these opening principles down, you can understand when to break them. And this is what separates a good player with a, good, with a great player, um, is to know of these principles and when to break them. Uh, the second uh, way to like think about a position is to think about the pawn structures. So there are very common pawn structures that could occur. For example, an isolated queen's pawn, or hanging pawns, or double pawns. Um, or um, we can also look at, for example, um, yeah, uh, pawn structures based on the opening. So let's say we can get a French structure, which occurs in the French defense, uh, where white occupies a lot of space. Uh, but black looks to undermine that center uh, with, yeah, with flank pawns, essentially. Uh, yeah, with specifically with c5 or f6, basically. Um, also, uh, hedgehog, the hedgehog structure is very common. It's Sicilian positions, uh, which, we know, which we need to know how to play with or against, yeah, depending on your repertoire. Um, and obviously, there's also like uh, openings uh, in the uh, Queen's Gambit decline, such as the Carlsbad, uh, pawn structure, which is a very, very common and typical pawn structure, uh, which, yeah, like both sides need to know. I think if you want to be like a good player, you really need to know uh, like the general ideas. Even if you don't play it, you should know the general ideas of the Carlsbad. Um, and the third principle, uh, the third, it's not principle, it's recommendation, is to identify the ideal squares for a piece. So again, uh, when we're looking at a position, let's say we've developed all of our pieces. One way we can try to improve the position is to think of the ideal square for a piece. How can I improve my pieces further? Or gain some sort of advantage, um, either positionally, um, yeah, or like gaining more space in the center because that's one of our, uh, one of the important assets that we need to think of in chess. Um, and the next one is to trade, is when we can trade one asset for another asset. So for example, if we accept an isolated queen's pawn, which is a pawn in the center of the board, typically on d4, which um, is which cannot be defended by another pawn, uh, because like let's say for example, uh, we have a pawn on d4, and there are no pawns on the uh, c or e files, then the pawn can be potentially weak, right? Like if black manages to blockade the pawn, ideally with a knight. Let's say if the black knight enters d5, um, and they will just like keep putting pressure on the on this isolated queen's pawn and eventually they can win the pawn and enter like just a winning endgame if we allow that. However, when we accept 
a, pot a potentially weak isolated queen spawn, we generally get open diagonals and we get a lot of attacking possibilities. And so it's really not like that clear um, in many positions if an IQP is weak or if it's actually an advantage to have because we can go for a very strong attack. Um, and so it really depends on uh, like basically the better player will win those kinds of positions and if they take advantage um, in the right moment. Um, and yeah, the next one is to compare tempos used and tempos gained. This is a bit more advanced because uh, when we're calculating specific variations and we want to, um, like let's say we're, we enter a, uh, an opening that we don't know, um, we can compare it with a lot of uh, the positions that we know ourselves and see is like is a move included in this variation actually useful um useful for us or is that actually detrimental to us and so by looking at the different moves included in certain positions um we can actually determine if this position is better for us uh, or if our opponent is actually better or if it's an equal position um so yeah this is a very important um um, aspect of chess, especially in the higher levels. And the next uh, the next one is to compare positions with one move included. So um, I'll show a very like, recent example in the 2023 World Championship um, match between Ding Luren and Jan Nepomneshi, uh, where a, like, a flank pawn was moved and we and it, it immediately gets like your opponent out of preparation, but we need to always like, compare positions that we know so based on like our open our opening studies, uh, we can like compare those positions um, and try to discover if that move is actually useful or if it's actually um, detrimental in any way um, to our position. Um, yeah, I'll show like more concrete examples obviously after this, but that's the gist of it. And the next one is to think long term in the middle game or end game. So this particularly pertains pertains to when we move a pawn very far advanced, if this pawn will be, I uh, like if it will be too advanced to the point where it is vulnerable and can be won, or if it's an act actually an asset that is very strong and can be defended sufficiently. Um, and I'll show an example in the Karakon actually, where um, the pawn may be an advantage, but it also may be a disadvantage uh, when it's like far advanced uh, so far. And the last one is to uh, think about like preparation and our the results of our research basically when we prepare certain openings against opponents or we just do our opening studies then we can um really like put out uh, like you know like 10 15 even 25 moves of theory we call it theory so uh, moves that have been established as the best moves in that position we can just uh, play those without even thinking twice because we actually know that opening and we can um play really fast. Uh, this is especially useful in Blitz Chess, um, but I would say that if you're basically under like 2000, you shouldn't think about this too much. Um, at least 2000 like uh, online uh, rating. Um, because this like, you could use your time a lot better than just studying openings and you know, getting adjustable cores and like trying to get as much um, in your memory as possible. Um, yeah, these are just like basically theory monkeys where they're just trying to, um, you know, try to get a win as fast as possible because they know the opening. They're not even thinking about um, improving their game. They just want to like play the opening well and just get a lot of quick wins. Uh, so this really is like not the optimal way to uh, improve your chess if that's your goal. Uh, if you just want to have fun, then like feel free to do whatever you want. But I'm just saying that if you want to improve your game, you should really not be thinking about theory too much when you're in the um, like under, let's say, 18 to 1800 or 2000 range. Um, obviously, you should know your openings like uh, decently well. Like you should not be surprised in the first like, you know, five moves basically, um, or yeah, something around uh, along those lines. But you should just have like, this is my opening. This is the openings that I play. Uh, I'll just play principal chess and um, eventually uh, you'll improve a lot that way. Um, so yeah, the next part is the theories in thinking. So the first one is Alexander Kotov's Tree of Analysis. So uh, when Alexander Kotov published his book, uh, How to Think uh, Like a Grandmaster, 
uh, he introduced this theory of uh, the tree of analysis, which, as you can see on the right here, is based on um, creating uh, I, like candidate moves. So first off, when you look at the position, um, you should identify the possible moves that you are considering. Uh, you should list them out, and then you should branch them out uh, in concrete variations. So I think uh, Kotov recommends like looking at one variation, very uh, like looking at the candidate moves, and then looking at the for example, candidate move A, and then like going really in depth into that, and only then moving on to the next branch uh, of the tree. Uh, but this is very dogmatic because, um, like, we often don't think that way, and this can be like a very big waste of time if we uh, if we think this way. Um, the thing is that if you oftentimes like a person who creates theories uh, in a certain field. Uh, obviously, it's not just not just limited to chess. But if they create a theory, they oftentimes shape their thinking uh, and have a bias towards thinking that way, just because they've created the theory and they want to believe it. So be very careful that this is not this like the only way to think, and not definitely not the way that you should think every single time, uh, because it's very dogmatic. However, in very forcing variations, I would say that this is very useful. Uh, you should identify the candidate moves first. So that, that is definitely correct. And only then look at the variations um, like uh, more in depth. But you shouldn't like look at it, look at it um, too much um, like with too many concrete variations where you're wasting so much time on one branch and you're not even considering like um, the possible deviations in, in each of the other branch because you're so focused on one. Um, and uh, Alexander Kotov in his book um, mentions that there are two distinctions of this tree of analysis which is the bear trunk and the coppice um and so this is the um basically the illustration of a bear trunk and a coppice where um a bear trunk is where a combination has only one variation and so there is no real tree um with a with a single offshoot so because it's yeah it's only basically like one forcing variation that you just need to calculate in depth uh, I will show um, an example of this um, in the uh, when we look at the board. And the next one is a coppice, where it's just basically uh, when we're trying to find the correct move, uh, we analyze a lot of uh, a large number of short and simple variations, and only then determine what the best move is. Maybe after identifying that, the, yeah, like this is the best move by, for example, process of, of elimination. Then we can look more into depth into that variation and expand more and, you know, um, try to um, see what's happening in the position and play, to, yeah, play the position um, the best way, basically. Um, and the next method um, is the quick scan method, which was, uh, I'm not sure if this is like a formal um, theory uh, per se, but this was mentioned by uh, John Nunn in his book, Secrets uh, of Practical Chess. Uh, where basically the idea is to look briefly at all the major lines to see if any if, if any of them can be quickly resolved. For example, if we look at, if we have five candidate moves and we look at each of them and we notice that the fifth candidate move um, immediately loses to something tactically, then we can just eliminate it and only think about four. And then maybe it even it can even be dumbed down to three and then maybe two. And maybe in those two variations, it's a bit more complicated. So you know that you can spend more time looking at those. Um, however, be very careful that your analysis in the beginning, when you're looking at the position, can be very skewed. So uh, you might be looking at those five candidate moves, and you might be like in the beginning, you might erase the first, uh, erase the fifth candidate move, and then the, the fourth candidate move, and the third candidate move. But maybe you realize that wait, maybe I see another idea. Let me include this fifth candidate move again. And actually, uh, at second glance and it, with deeper analysis, it's not that bad. And it may be the best move. So don't disregard um, the candidate moves that you've uh, discarded in the beginning because your evaluation may be very skewed. And this is really common, actually. I still have a problem of like um, not evaluating certain positions correctly. And yeah, this really uh, is a problem that I think a lot of players have evaluating positions correctly and also um, when they like when they eliminate candidate moves they don't go back to it and then they just lose this great opportunity um, in the game so yeah um, 
uh, the last part is the uh, few of the other important things. Um, these are the fundamentals. So I think that the number one thing that will improve your rating uh, for players under 2200 online is being able to punish tactical or positional errors. So first off, you need to identify if your opponent has made a tactical or positional error. And one thing that I like to say to my students is to always think critically of your opponent's moves. Be skeptical and don't trust that your opponent makes the best moves. Um, like even when I'm playing like a 2100 a player, like 2100 rated player Fide, like even in classical chess, they give opportunities. Like it's once you see that in action and you see that strong players actually miss a lot of things, you can like get confident and not just fall under the psychological pressure that, oh, my opponent has more rating than me. My opponent is better than me. It's it's not that clear. And once you see that uh, your opponent, uh, once you get enough experience that your opponents actually make mistakes, you will like kind of lose this um, uh, psychological uh, pressure of my opponent is better than me, I think. Um, and also, in that sense, you shouldn't, uh, in the opposite spectrum of that, you should also not be over optimistic in your chances. Um, so, like, if our opponent plays something that we've never seen before and we think, oh, this cannot be a good move, and we try too hard to punish it, this may actually backfire. And so, we also don't want to be over optimistic. Um, and yeah, the next thing, the next fundamental are the end games. So, the, ba the basic end games and a lot more. For example, the pawn end games, such as like the basic concept of opposition um, defending against our opponent who has an who has an extra pawn, um, like a king and pawn versus king position, and also how to win those positions. Um, also, rook and pawn end games are very important. Uh, the Philidor and Lucina position are ones that are talked about very frequently. Um, but also about practical, practically playing those rook and pawn end games, um, knowing when to like. Uh, if you should create weakness, uh, no, you should never create weaknesses, but, um, you know, knowing like how to create an outside pass pawn, um, knowing where our king is best placed, um, and uh, yeah, other factors uh, in the end game uh, to consider, you know, king activity and things like that. Um, also, the rule of the square is just a very common shortcut that you can use um, to um, calculate really quickly uh, if a pass pawn will be able to be promoted before our opponent king or before our king is able to stop the pawn. Um, so yeah, uh, the fourth one is to create a pass pawn correctly. So if we're in an end game and we're up a pawn, let's say, uh, we need to understand that an outside pass pawn, so a pawn, a lone pawn on the edge of the board, for example, on the A file or the H file is a very like important uh, resource that we can use uh, to try to uh, win those positions if we're up a pawn, essentially. Um, but also, there are different ways to try to defend if we're on the defending side. So if we're down the pawn, then we, we can also think about different ways of defending that position. Um, and also, holding a worse endgame, um, basically putting up the most resistance um, when we're in a worse position in the endgame. Let's say we're down a pawn, or even our king isn't as active, something as... Uh, which seems just as trivial as that, uh, can be the deciding factor of whether the game is drawn or if the game is lost. Um, and yeah, the basics to master are the checkmates, so how to checkmate with the queen uh, versus a lone king, and how to checkmate with the rook versus a lone king, and also checkmating with a bishop and knight, and also checkmating with two bishops. Um, the th yeah, checkmating with two bishops isn't that difficult, but you do need to know. Maybe uh, you just practice a few times playing it against the engine, um, and you'll get it down very quickly, I think. Um, and the bishop and knight is a bit more tricky, but once you practice it enough, you'll be able to get it like really quickly, um, I think. Uh, if you're a beginner, you don't need to know how to do it because how often will it really occur? Like realistically, um, yeah, you don't really need to think about that. But I have had it in one tournament game, so I cannot say that like don't learn it at all because it will maybe occur like uh, once or twice in your entire lifetime so um, and the next one is to evaluate positions accurately so this is where it gets tricky because like even strong players can evaluate positions very wrong and when I was when I was analyzing a game with one of my friends uh, who's a very strong player actually he's 
a 2100 rated FIDE Master. Um, we were evaluating the position like just at a glance uh, from this game that we played. Um, and to, after checking with the computer, like almost every single move was wrong. Like we made so many mistakes in evaluating the position correctly because, okay, maybe it's just a fundamental lack of understanding in that specific complicated position. Um, but we could also like just, if we uh, studied the positions enough, then we could improve our uh, evaluating uh, capabilities. And there are a few ways to try to evaluate positions correctly. The first and most basic one is to count material. So a pawn is worth one point. A knight and bishop are both uh, worth three points. A rook is worth five points and a queen is worth nine points. While the king cannot be valued because once you lose the king, it's game over. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a, b a bit of nuance in that. Um, some people say that uh, the bishop is worth 3.25 points while the knight is worth three because maybe they consider the bishop slightly stronger than the knight. Uh, Gary Kasparov and Bobby Fischer were known to uh, have said these things. Um, I think that uh, Fischer was the first one to say that the bishop is worth 3.25. Um, but that really is more nuanced um, and something that if you're a beginner, you don't really need to think too much about, uh, except for the fact that the bishop pair, so the fact that one side has a pair of bishops can be very good in an open position where there are diagonals open everywhere. So that's an asset, a positional aspect that we need to consider. Um, and also the next one is uh, to compare the quality of pieces. An easy way to do this is that if you reach a middle game, we can look, we can compare our bishop uh, compared to our opponent's bishop. We can compare our queen compared to our opponent's queen and our knights compared to our opponent's knights, um, our rooks compared and our king safety compared. And so we can compare the quality pieces and determine which of our pieces should be improved. Um, and or we can also think about which piece needs to be traded um, because that piece is bad, for example. And we can also compare white and black's pawn structure. Um, so if one side has a weakness, then we can uh, know basically which side has the advantage. Um, it's not that clear a lot of the times because there are like, maybe if you if you have a weakness in your in your pawn structure, you may have something gained from that, from that um, um, pawn structure, let's say. Um, and the next one is to determine the best strategy to apply in a specific position. Um, yeah, so this is really specific. Um, first off, it can depend on the opening. Um, because like in, in modern chess, you cannot just go for, you know, your own plan and not think about your opponent's plans. It's very dependent and very specific to if my opponent plays this, this kind of plan, I should go for this because uh, this is better, let's say. <laughs> Uh, and so, yeah, it really depends um, how we try to find uh, the best strategy, but we can do it based on experience when we know the opening that we're playing or um, when we um, yeah, basically just try to think about the position in the position in an abstract sense. So, uh, for example, my goal is to occupy the center. How can I accomplish this? And so you can think, oh, let me put all of my pawns in the center. Let me aim my pieces towards the center. That's already a strategic goal that you can have in mind um, going forward. Uh, the fifth one is to create and identify weaknesses. So um, you need to be able to identify weaknesses, which are especially easy if it's like pawn structure weaknesses, let's say doubled pawns or like uh, hanging pawns, things like that. Um, and we can also, yeah, I mean, that's especially uh, like common. Um, but also in the, it gets more nuanced when we're talking about like king safety, um, because when we want to generate, generate an attack, we need to also think about, is it, is it like, um, is it reasonable to go for this attack? Is, does it make, you know, is it realistic to go for this attack? And so, um, we also need to think about, uh, the attacking possibilities, uh, and which side has the initiative. So which side is really pushing forward, putting pressure on, on the opponent and things like that. Um, and yeah, we also need to know how to create those weaknesses so that we could take advantage of it in the future. Um, and the last one is, you know, just practice frequently. Um, if you play more games, um, especially like those in the faster time control, then you'll really understand that, oh, 
you'll eventually improve this ability to like um, evaluate positions correctly. Um, and I think that this is like the most useful way to improve your uh, evaluating abilities. Um, a few of the chess skills to improve is the calculation. So improve your uh, improve your ability to find candidate moves, uh, the number of moves, you know, the number of candidate moves that you think of, and also the depth of calculation when you create your tree of variations. Um, also, the next one is to improve your positional play. Um, I recommend reading this book, Mastering Chess Strategy by Johan Helsten, um, published in 2010, um, which introduces these four um, basic um, outlines on how to improve your um, how to improve your position strategically, which are which is to improve your pieces, um, using pawns to achieve your strategic goals. So pawn play, um, exchanging pieces favorably. And also the last is prophylaxis. So how you can um, prevent your opponent's plans. And as a result, your opponent doesn't have a lot of counterplay, we call it. So doesn't have a, like a clear strategic goal in mind. And so they just don't know what to do. And we can like win those games very smoothly. Uh, someone who's known for this kind of um, beautifully, a beautiful like master, uh, masterful like prophylaxis play is Anatoly Karpov, uh, who just frequently um, is referred to like his playing style is referred to as a boa constrictor where he just uh, prevents your opponent's plans and just and only then does he continue with his plans to try to um, yeah just to try to uh, make your opponent suffer basically um, and the last one is opening play so again as I mentioned before I recommend that if you're under like 1500 you should just have like basic two to five move preparation don't um, dwell on it too much, don't spend too much time on it, but just understand the basic ideas of the opening rather than memorizing the lines and trying to play them as fast as possible. You should understand the ideas behind the opening. Which pieces are good? What am I going for um, Yeah, in the future of this, uh, of this middle game? Uh, things to do, definitely analyze your games after. This is definitely the thing that has made, like, made the most significant improvement to my game as fast as possible. Um, it might be nice to like, you know, spend time uh, analyzing uh, like openings and like, because there are so many like good courses online nowadays. Uh, it might be fun because you feel like you know what you're doing, but you're not, but I, I, I definitely realized that analyzing your games is definitely the number one thing that will improve um, your level as fast as possible. Uh, and you will notice it in your rating changes. Uh, things to avoid, being overly aggressive. A lot of people, they will not improve like in their entire lifetime because they refuse to change their style because they think that it's either I'm checkmating now or I don't want to get a boring game. Um, despite the fact that there is so many like rich things in chess other than going for an attack, like you can play beautiful strategic games and which you can be proud of and you don't need to be overly aggressive. Mm -hmm. However, a lot of people are stuck in this mindset of being overly aggressive and as a result, they don't improve and they're stuck in the 1200 uh, level for all their lives. So definitely don't be too aggressive. And also don't be too stubborn. Um, like if we, um, if we want to, I mean, we can think about it in a chess sense in that you don't want to like just be always like only thinking about your ideas. Oh, I want to accomplish this. I should always be aiming towards this, not thinking about your opponent's plans. That's obviously bad. But more what I'm talking about here about not being stubborn is that you should be always flexible in your thinking approach. Don't be so rigid and um, like, this is the only way I'm able to think. I'm, I, I'm like, for example, I hear a lot of people say that I'm an attacking player. I can't play positional chess. You have to be able to play positional chess. That's like, that's not negotiable. You have to if you want to be able to get to a high level. And so don't be stubborn. Always be open-minded to improve. Uh, always learn more. Um, even someone who may be um, like uh, someone at your level, let's say, can teach you a thing or two. Um, yeah, just by analyzing with them, just by talking with them. Uh, and, and especially when you're talking with stronger players, you can learn a lot. So yeah, finally, these are the materials that I recommend reading. First is Think Like a Grandmaster. It's, um, you know, people are very split, I think nowadays, of whether it's, you know, too dogmatic or not. But I like it. Uh, when you're focusing on like forcing variations, it really helps to think of it in a structured way. 
Uh, the next one is Secrets of Practical Chess by John Nunn. Very good book. Talks about talks more uh, more uh, stuff than you know, uh, not just chess things, but also psychological um, in tournament chess, like what to think about and things like that. Very good book. One of my favorites. Uh, the next one is Evaluate Like a Grandmaster by Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein and Vita Master Nate Solon. It's a new book, actually, I think, published in like 2022. Uh, and it gives a lot of exercises on um, evaluating a lot of different positions. Um, basically, it's not like a puzzle book, uh, a traditional puzzle book where you um, are asked to find the best move. Uh, you're In this specific book, you're also asked about what do you think about the position is one side much better, is one side much worse, things like that. Um, and it's like really fast paced actually, and I really like this book. Um, I think this will, be, this will be useful, not for beginners, but for uh, stronger players, definitely, or intermediate to stronger players. Um, the next one is the famous, um, yeah, um, books by Jakob Agard. Um, he has like so many nice books um, explaining the concepts in strategic play, calculation, end game. Uh, yeah, um, what else? Like positional play. Um, yeah, attack and defense. Uh, and he also has also one book called Thinking Inside the Box. Um, all of these are beautiful books that you should definitely read um, when you get to a higher level and you want to uh, get to the next stage. Essentially, uh, it's kind of like it's not an, uh, these are not easy books. You definitely uh, need to have like um, a lot of dedication and motivation to finish these books. But if you do, you'll improve significantly. Um, and yeah, that essentially concludes this presentation. Um, we're just going to be moving moving on to the chessboard. So see you there. Okay, so we're on the chessboard right now, and I'm going to link the study as well as the presentation that I used before. Um, in the link below that you can download. So if you wanna, if you're a coach and you want to teach your student, um, and teach your students, and you think that, um, you know, the ideas that I mentioned in this presentation were useful, then feel free to do so. Um, and yeah, so the first chapter is just talking about all of the principles. Um, there be there may be more, um, but these are just the basic ones that I think apply um, to most chess positions. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to be looking at the principles in action. And in the next chapter, we're going to look at the exception to these rules. So um, 1e4, since we know that we need to control the center, 1e4 does a really good job in controlling the d5 square and f5 square as well. Um, and this, okay, so as I mentioned before, like your preference, whether you want to play 1e4 or 1d4, it really depends on what you uh, are more comfortable with. Because the openings in these, like uh, already on the first move, um, it like changes everything. So basically after d4, you have the option of uh, like black has the option of going into the King's Indian defense, the Nimzo Indian, um, the Bogo Indian, like all of these other, these defenses with like knight f6 and g6, let's say. However, we notice that once we play e4, um, knight f6 uh, is a move, which is known as the Alakine's defense, the Alakine defense. And the problem with this move is that it's not really sound because the knight gets kicked around. And so you, we see that already on move one, uh, black is faced with a choice that they cannot de develop this knight after f6 and play g6 and bishop g7 so quickly. If they want to develop the bishop to here, they're going to need to play a suboptimal opening, which is the modern defense with g6, and then place the bishop on g7, but it allows white to take over the center. Um, we will look a bit more uh, on this opening um, yeah, in the exception to the rules, because it's still playable, but it's just not very principled. Um, and so yeah, after e4, um, we're just gonna look at uh, e4, e5, the king's pawn opening, and um, I want to bring your attention to this move, queen h5, which is a common choice by many um, like beginners, where they're just simply attacking the pawn on e5, and they want to bring the bishop out to c4 to threaten the scholar's mate. Um, but our fifth principle tells us that we shouldn't develop our queen too quickly, because after the simple moves, knight c6, to defend the pawn, Bishop c4, black has a simple move g6, kicking the queen back and not allowing the checkmate. And after queen f3, black simply blocks the uh, pressure on the f7 pawn with knight f6. And they just have two pieces developed, while white has two pieces. However, the second piece developed is a queen, which is like, which is actually taking away a square that might be useful for the knight. And so the queen is not really developed. It's actually really uh, hindering white's development. And so after the following moves, knight e2, 
uh, preventing any knight d4 um, advances. Bishop g7 and the white plays d3 and castles. Black just ends up getting a better position because of the lead in development. Uh, black is already castled. They have the uh, three pieces, three minor pieces out, and white has two, and a queen which is awkwardly placed on f3. And so this is not really to be recommended. And so the best move by far is knight f3, just to develop your pieces towards the center. Um, after knight c6, bishop c4. So this move aims aims towards the center, especially the d5 score, but it also targets the f7 pawn, which on the chessboard, the f2 and f7 pawns are the weakest squares on the board in your initial position because it's only defended by the king. However, um, concretely, uh, this pawn cannot be taken advantage of um, like in any serious like opening um, because, yeah, because you know, black has nothing done nothing wrong and white has done nothing wrong. And so if they play principled chess, then they shouldn't get into any trouble. Um, besides that, uh, another move is the Spanish game, which is very popular, uh, even more popular than the Italian, um, which puts pressure on the knight and it indirectly controls the center in the sense that at any point, this knight can be taken and the pawn on e5 can be undermined of its defense. However, after a6, it's not really possible to take it now, because after d takes e6, if we take the pawn, then black has this annoying move queen d4 with a fork on these two um, these two pieces. After the knight retreats, uh, queen takes e4, white has to trade the queen, so otherwise they have to move the king. Um, and after this exchange, clearly black has nothing uh, to be concerned about. They do have double pawns, but in compensation, they have the bishop pair. And the bishop pair in an open position such as this, where you see a lot of diagonals possibly open, you know, everywhere all across the board, um, black is doing more than fine here. And I would prefer to play, to play black in this position. Um, so, yeah, after a6, let's say uh, white should retreat with the bishop to a4, still keeping an eye on this knight. But let's say after knight f6, white can castle. And if they take on e4, uh, white can play the move d4. And this enters the so-called open Spanish, because... Uh, we're threatening, let's say if they take on e d4, then we have rook e1, which is a really good um, really good response after this. Knight takes d4, there's a lot of pressure here, and with the threat of f3, this is very, very sketchy uh, for, for black. And so I think white is already better. And so after knight f6, castles, black typically plays bishop e7 to cover the e-file. And so now actually knight takes e4 may be a threat, and so rook e1 is played. And after defending the e-pawn, there is no more like bishop takes c6, dc6. We can see that queen d4. Uh, okay, wait, hold on. After we play bishop takes c6 in this position, if black plays a random move like castles, then now we can take the pawn. And after dc6, knight takes e5, there is no more queen d4 because the pawn is simply defended. And so white can just retreat with the knight and attack the queen simultaneously. And white is simply up a pawn. And so after rook e1, the best move is to play b5. So that now there is no more option of taking the knight on c6, and so the e5 pawn is safe. And after bishop b3, now black can simply castle. And we reach a mainline tabia. So a tabia is where uh, the options start to branch out, and black and white has many options here. They can play the move c3, and then allow this very famous pawn sacrifice known as the martial gambit, or the, the martial attack actually, uh, just sacrificing a pawn. And this obviously goes into a lot of theory that I don't wanna go into, or they can choose another move besides c3, such as either a4 or h3. Uh, and these are fine options, clearly. Um, or even like d3 is playable, I think. Um, yeah, just very playable. Uh, and so you see that there are many... Uh, the ideas in the mainline openings are really logical, but there are a lot of nuances uh, and subtleties that you need to know if you play them. Uh, and so that's just a bit of the uh, Spanish game. However, I want to aim your attention to the Italian game, which has a lot more principles in play. After bishop c4, um, if black plays a move like h6, which violates our principle of not making too many useless pawn moves, we see that this the idea of h6 is to prevent any knight g5 advances to pressure the pawn on f7. However, what can make use of this lead in development to immediately strike in the center? And after e takes d4, uh, we can just castle, and this is the way to play. We're just playing with initiative, and we don't even care if we're sacrificing a pawn. Let's say after knight f6, we can even play e5. Um, and after e5, if the knight has to retreat back to g8, then this is clearly just bad after rook e1. Um, all of black's pieces are in the back rank, essentially. Um, so they're going to have to find this move uh, after e5 to play this thematic move d5. 
um, which is very common response when the bishop is on c4. Um, and it's not possible if the bishop is on b5, right? But here, after we play bishop b5, pinning the knight, uh, knight d7, we can play rook e1, defending the pawn, bishop c5, and then now c3 is a really nice move. Sacrificing the pawn, and if black ignores it, then we're just going to get a massive center with a big advantage. Um, and so after d takes c3, um, white can simply take on d5 here. And for castle, knight takes c3, black is in a lot of trouble because uh, all of white pieces are active on their optimal squares. Um, yeah, and these pieces are really um, loose, um, like the bishop on c8 cannot develop, and there's already the threat of taking on c6 and just winning a pawn. Um, so this position is already really good. White has more space in the center also, um, and more development. And yeah, there's no reason that uh, why, um, why black is even equalizing in this position. Um, so that comes back to, yeah, we come back to this position after bishop c4. And what and black's most common move, common move is, is the move bishop c5, just symmetrically um, opposing white's Italian bishop. And after c3, uh, okay, so we can castle here, but the main move is c3, and this can actually transpose. But this goes into a lot of theory after knight f6. Besides the move d3, which um, defends the center and is more of a slow approach to the position, uh, white can also go for d4. But this becomes more wild and enters a lot more forcing theory that you would need to know if you play this kind of move order with c3. Um, and But you may ask, like, why is c3 not a useless move, like a useless pawn move compared to a move like h6? Now, the reason is that this actually supports the advance in the center with d4. However, after knight f6, uh, the d4 lines uh, aren't amazing for white. And so typically, white just plays d3 and plays conservatively and just castles. Uh, tries to expand on the queen side maybe and tries to develop the knight out to d2 maybe the rook comes to e1 and they're gonna try to Im slowly improve their knight and enter this deep strategic battle um and so c3 has the purpose of playing of pushing d4 so for example after d6 i think d4 here is already really good um but instead white after white castles here knight f6 now there's a threat on the e4 pawn and so white needs to develop uh and defend also the pawn. So d3 is a nice move to defend the pawn and also uh, prepare uh, the possibility of this bishop coming out on this diagonal. Um, and after this position, um, white needs to understand like, what am I trying to play for here? Um, and so this is where understanding of a position and how often you practice in a certain opening really plays a role into how well you can play. Um, yeah. Uh, so basically um, in this position after let's say d6, white can play c3. And so if we play a move like knight c3, which is very common in the beginner levels, we need to notice that um, this first up blocks a c pawn, which means that we do not have this, we do not have this possibility of expanding in the center. And additionally, um, white, black has this move knight a5, which is really annoying because they're going to win our bishop pair, which we've already established is a, is a really, uh, is a valuable asset in, in most positions. Um, and if you want to like look more on uh, like look at why the bishop pair is like such of high value, uh, you can look at a lot of model games um, anywhere on YouTube. They should be explaining like the function of the bishop pair and showing like model games as to when when the bishop pair can be used to your advantage. Uh, but in this position, after let's say bishop b3, black can just simply castle, and the bishop is not going anywhere, um, and so. Yeah, once, once we lose the bishop pair, black is just going to have the two bishops and a long-term advantage. Um, okay, I mean, like, the position objectively is still equal, but it's easier to play with the black pieces because of the bishop pair. And so here, c3 is the best move, which, after this move, knight a5 is not really possible because white can, first off, it just escape with the bishop. Uh, bishop b5, c6, bishop a4, coming back to c2. Uh, and instead, these pieces are loose, and the immediate threat is to play b4 which I don't think can be stopped actually. Because of b5, then the bishop comes back to uh, comes back here and possibly black has to play something like b4. Um, but clearly that's not what they want. Um, and yeah, so after bishop b5, yeah, white is simply escaping with the bishop, maintaining the bishop pair while these two pieces are awkward. And so after a6, um, white can expand in the center, uh, on the queen side here with a4 preventing any b5 advances and also preparing to expand on the queen side uh, and yeah just advance upon the b4 and a5 let's say 
Uh, additionally, White has this other move, bishop b3, which just aims to develop the bishop back or retreat the bishop back to c2 so that it's safe from any knight a5 threats. Um, and yeah, that goes into a lot of other theory, but essentially we'll, we can just follow this line after a4, castles, h3. Now, since black has castled on this side of the board, and white has also, uh, we can play this useful move to prevent any bishop g4 uh, developments. And so, seeing that maybe d4, black sees that maybe d4 can be a possibility to gain a tempo attacking this bishop. And so black has a very common move, bishop a7, uh, it just aimed at uh, preventing any d4 advances uh, uh, while hitting the bishop. And so here, white can play rook e1, developing the rook towards the center. h6, also mimicking white and making a useful developing move, or actually prophylactic move, uh, preventing bishop g5. Um, and let's say after knight bd2, rook e8, white can continue this position in many ways. One way is to develop this knight um, to f1 and to g3 to try to make use of the f5 square. And the reason that this maneuver is effective is because when, so once we develop all of our pieces, okay, maybe this bishop, this bishop isn't fully developed, but we can see that white needs to determine a plan. What do I have to do to improve my position? And so one of the ways to improve your position is to improve your pieces. And so this knight is not doing a lot on d2, you know, it's really... Um, it's really superfluous in the sense that it cannot go to c4 and it cannot go to e4. And so it's going to try to find new ways to develop, uh, like to go on this side of the board. Let's say after bishop e6 and we trade, we can go to g3 and possibly to f5 where the knight is much better placed there. Uh, black is of course not without counterplay, but white can continue with this plan with no issues. Um, but instead b4 is also possible. Um, just trying to expand on the queen side and after bishop e6, trying to trade those bishops off and we oblige bishop takes e6, rook takes e6, white can play either the moves queen c2, very logical, very natural, developing the queen, and um, saying that I don't know where I want to develop this bishop yet. I might want to trade off the bishops with like knight f1 and bishop e3, because this bishop is really nice on this diagonal, or I might, you know, just put the bishop on b2 later. However, bishop b2 is also a move, um, which doesn't look like it makes a lot of sense, because it's blocked by its own pawn, but it has really good potential if we play the move c4 in the future, uh, or even like possible d4 advances uh, where the bishop is supporting the d-pawn. Uh, after knight e7, trying to improve the piece, uh, like possibly to g6, so similar to like what white is doing with knight f1, knight g3. Um, after knight f1, knight g6, and so here white can expand with c4. And it's been very principled thus far. White, now with this last move, tries to gain space in the center, um, and black needs to come up with a plan. Um, you know, if, if they play some, if they play some like slow move like queen d7 or something that doesn't really have a purpose, white can just continue normally with knight g3, possibly to f5, and even if given enough time, you can try to generate an attack on the king side. Um, and so in this position, a common maneuver is actually to play this move knight h7 to try to go to g5 and try to exchange off this really good knight on f3. Um, and also possibly if they can uh, play knight f4 and then play the rook on g6, then there will be a very crushing attack. And so here, white normally plays knight g3, and for knight g5, uh, the position, yeah, just branches out from here. Like, um, But black and white both have like uh, trumps to the position. Um, and yeah, so instead of knight h7, also like white, black can also play knight h5 here, trying to occupy the f4 square. After knight e3, knight h to f4, black is also fine. And so... In in every single opening, black is fine, clearly. Like Otherwise, white would win like 90% of the games, right? Um, but it's just really a strategic battle most of the time um, where we're trying to accomplish our goals, but we also want to prevent our opponent uh, from becoming too active and getting like uh, any any hope of, a, of an advantage, essentially. Um, so yeah, that just covers one of the lines um, in the Italian game where we can see the chess principles in action in one of the main variations in chess. Uh, now we can look at the exceptions to the rules. Um, actually, hold on. I actually want to mention uh, another line. Um, let's say we can look at we can look at another very popular opening uh, nowadays, which is the Karakhan after e4 and c6. Now, the the point of c6 is that Black wants to occupy the center, which is very principled, but they want to occupy it with a pawn. And so after White occupies the full center. Black can challenge it with d5. And from this position, the 
uh, like lines can branch out, branch out like white can go for the exchange variation after e takes d5 they can play e5 which is the advanced variation or they can play knight c3 just developing a piece and um, allowing the center to be taken and they all lead to different kinds of play for example i just want to show a bit of the main line after black takes and develops a bishop out to f5 the knight comes back to g3 because it's because it's being threatened uh, the bishop comes back to g6 and white can play this move h4 threatening h5 to win the bishop and so black can play h6 to give the bishop some room on h7. And the main line goes something like knight f3, developing, uh, threatening knight e5 actually to try to win the bishop. So knight d7, h5, bishop h7, and bishop d3. So trading that good bishop takes takes. Uh, and then after e6, uh, giving the bishop some scope, uh, bishop d2, just preparing to castle long. Knight gf6, developing normally, castling to get the king to safety. Uh, one of the main lines is bishop e7, um, just developing and preparing castle short. King b1, securing the king so that uh, this a pawn is well defended. And if we castle queenside, most often, more often than not, we want to place the king on b1. Um, like in some situations, maybe our priority is to go for, the, for an attack, and king b1 may not be useful. For example, in the modern defense, some lines include the king not being on b1. However, most of the time, um, the king needs to be on b1, so it's just safer. Um, queen b6, rook h1, developing, and castle short. And so here, yeah, the position is very interesting, clearly. And white will try to, try, try, you know, just to go for an attack here. Um, because they've castled on opposite wings. And as I mentioned before, if we castle on opposite, opposite sides of the board, then the play can become really wild and very attacking uh, very quickly. So... That's just one of the lines in the Karakhan defense. Um, now we can go to the exceptions to the rules. So after e4, one of the one of a like it's a very popular blitz weapon uh, is the move d5 here, which is known as a Scandinavian defense, and this really breaks the principle because after e takes d5 and queen takes d5, white can hit the queen with knight c3, and now we can gain a useful tempo on the queen, forcing the queen back to move, while we can get a lead in, lead in development. Um, and this, this opening is playable, but it's not really good. Like, w the reason that Grandmasters don't play this in, especially in slow chess, is because white gets a really nice advantage if they know what they're doing. Um, and so one of the moves is like queen a5, which is the main line, uh, d4, so white occupies the center. And the problem with this opening is really, uh, if white wants to maximize their advantage, they're gonna need to play this, this line, knight f3, c6. Uh, controlling the d5 square, um, and after bishop c4, bishop f5, theory says that knight e5 here is by far the best move. And this is the reason that this knight e5 move in every single Scandinavian variation um, is the reason that it's not played at a high level at all. Uh, the thing is that what, what black is hoping for is that white simply castles, and after e6, rook e1, just playing normally, Knight bd7, bishop d2, queen c7. Black surprisingly just gets like a very playable position and has no issues at all with the king. Uh, they will just simply play bishop d6 and castles. Um, and black has no issues. Like the bishop is active on f5 and I think black already has a very pleasant position here. Um, and so that's what they were hoping for. However, with this knight e5 move, we're introducing some ideas of playing g4. So after e6, g4 is actually really strong. And after the bishop comes back to g6, h4 just threatens to trap the bishop. And if black ever plays h6, we can just take the bishop and grab on, grab the pawn. Um, so that's just winning. And so they're going to have to play knight d7. We can trade on d7, play h5. And the theory goes essentially after bishop e4, we can castle. Very nice move. Uh, now we see that we cannot take this bishop because the knight is being pinned. And so we can castle here. Now we're threatening the bishop. And so the bishop comes back to d5. And after we grab the bishop pair, cd5, bishop d3, white is just slightly better here in this position. And this line was basically forced um, out of the Scandinavian. And so I, I don't see like as black why why a player would want to go into this like voluntarily. Um, it's clear that white just has an advantage in this position. Uh, the king is a bit exposed, but uh, white has a bishop pair and the king is still stuck in the center. Um, so yeah, white has a really nice position here. Um, so that's just the Scandinavian defense. Um, 
Another exception to the to the principle of controlling the center is the move g6. Um, this is known as the modern defense, and after d4, bishop g7, the idea behind the modern defenses is to try to undermine the center with, let's say, knight c3, black can play d6, and one of the main lines is to play the move bishop e3, um, saying that I don't want to develop this knight out to f3 yet, I don't want to commit, I just want to play bishop e3, I want to play queen d2, and I want to try to trade off these bishops, which is a key defender in black's king side. Let's say after knight f6, we can play queen d2. And if they decide to castle, then already like f3 here, um, bishop h6, ideas of g4, h4, and h5 become really powerful. Uh, meanwhile, black is trying to um, try to undermine the center, let's say with a move like knight d7 and c5 uh, to try to chip on the center. Uh, another way to play this is for black to play a6. Um, and the idea is to expand uh, on the queen side here with b5 and develop the bishop to b7. After queen d2, b5, white can solidify the center with f3, defending the pawn. Knight d7, and after h4, black in here, I think, can... Okay, first off, they can play h5, knight h3, and then even c5 here. Something like this. And this is the idea behind the modern defenses, just to undermine the center. Um, I think white still has an advantage in most of these... In every single line, essentially. Uh, if they played correctly, but it's still a complicated game, and it's not clear, like, white is not just going to win uh, on the spot. So, th those are a couple of exceptions to the rules. Um, yeah, and we can actually go next to the tree of analysis. So, oops, just, if you saw whatever is on the right side of the screen, just ignore that. So, this is a an example of the bear trunk analysis, where it's a very forcing variation that we need to calculate all the way to the end. Um, and where essentially our opponent does not have many choices. And this is a position taken from a puzzle, actually, a very famous puzzle where Hikaru just mentions, like, uh, he goes onto the scare staircase method. Um, and so, yeah, we'll just see later what the scare st staircase method is. Um, yeah, so in this position, if it's white to move, White needs to look at all of the forcing options, so any checks, captures, and attacks. So let's eliminate the captures. There are no captures here. It's not possible. And so we need to look at the checks. Knight f6, just blunders the knight. Knight f8, ooh, that looks tempting, actually. Uh, let's see, we can We can develop, we can bring the queen out to e4, but once you play queen e4, we can calculate just a short bit that we see after, okay, queen g6 just loses to knight f8. Uh, and so we can see that maybe after king g7, um, I don't see the way for white to continue this checking because there's no there's no check on e7. If we give a check, they can just drop back, possibly. Um, I'm not sure which square, but this looks good enough uh, to me. And so, yeah, and so we calculate that queen e4 doesn't really do much. And so we need to look at the other check, net f8. And now we see that this actually eliminates a lot of possibilities. Uh, if they go to g7, then immediately they're uh, running into this fork and white is winning. If they go to h8, then after knight e6, there's a discover check. I think this is, yeah, I think I think this is the best move. Uh, King h8, but it's still losing. If they go to g8, which is the point, is that knight e6 uh, delivers a discover check, and black cannot block in any way, and so they're losing the queen, and white is winning. And so king h8, we understand, is the only move. And now we need to calculate what happens, what happens after knight e6. It looks like we're going to win the queen, but black has this move queen g8. And are we going to stop here? No, we need to understand that, okay, what other checks do I have? I really only have one check, queen a, queen a1. I can trade the queens, but that will simply be a draw. And so after queen a1, there's this really uh, thematic method to go for this uh, kind of um, pattern. After king h7, which is the only move, the king has only one legal square, and you don't want to block with the queen. So queen king h7, and slowly we can actually approach with the queen, in this kind of ladder fashion. Um, and the point is that if black ever blocks with queen g6, then we have knight f8 winning the queen. And so they cannot really ever block. And so we're just going to slowly step up the board. And this is like just a one line of calculation, right? And once we step up the board and king h7, we can ask ourselves, have we made any real progress? And yes, in this position, knight f8 just would... Uh, yeah, it's it checks the king and the black king has no other square to go to. So... Black is forced to give up the queen, and this is simply winning. And so this bear trunk 
uh, method of analysis really shows that a forcing variation can be calculated all the way to the end. Even though this is like a like a 15 move line, it's not a 15 move line in a like a in a strategic and complex position. It's a really it's really just a forcing line that you just need to see all the way to the end. And it's not really that difficult. It's just that you need to know that this pattern exists. Um, a next, the next one is the uh, tree of analysis, uh, is the coppice. So this is where you take a lot of, um, yeah, possible uh, candidate moves and you look at them uh, briefly and you can eliminate like which ones are just bad straight up. So this game I think was played by Reddy. Um, he starts with e4, e5, knight of three, knight c6. The opening doesn't really matter, but we see that uh, we get this kind of position, knight c3, b5, bishop b3, bishop c5, knight takes e5. So this is a common trick. Uh, it's called the center fork trick. The point is after knight takes e5, d4. Um, yeah, black is either forced to give up the piece back and white has a pawn in the center, uh, which is which is actually equal uh, according to theory. Um, but in this position, bishop d6 was played, which is an okay move. After d takes e5, bishop takes e5, uh, white plays f4. And after bishop takes c3, because you don't want to run into any e5 pushes, uh, bishop takes c3, bc3, we can see that the pawn structure is damaged, but white has the bishop pair and the nice center. The question is that if the center will be weak, um, because it's maybe under pressure, or if it will be a strength in that it can push black's pieces backwards. So after castles, e5 was played. And so before al before allowing this e5 push, black needs to know what am I going to do against the e5 advance. And if they simply come back to e8, this is just a bad position, like um, because the knight is backwards here, and what can simply castle, maybe break with c4 here, um, or even, I don't know, move like queen f3 here makes a lot of sense. Um, just attacking the rook, castles, bishop e3, with a nice position. And so against this e5 move, black already knew that they had to play this move c5. And so we can look at the, uh, I'm going to put a picture of the, uh, of what was analyzed essentially by Reddy um, after this move. He understood that he needed to play this move, otherwise he was worse. Um, and so the lines really um, are interesting. White can play like so many moves. There are five candidate moves here. Bishop a3 attacking the pawn. After which, what was analyzed was actually queen a5. After e takes f6, uh, queen takes a3. Um, Reddy actually missed this move queen d6, which is really powerful. Pinning the pawn to the queen and defending this uh, f6 pawn. And so after rook e8, king f2, uh, there is no c4 advance because the queen is hanging, right? And so white is simply better in this kind of position after rook h1 because there are just back rank problems with black position. Um, but that was missed. Other than that, uh, I think bishop b7 is the best move. After bishop takes c5, knight e4, black, yeah, sacrificing the exchange, but in return gets a lot of compensation because they can bring the queen in very actively after g3, sacrifice the knight. And the complications just work out here for black. And the position is just equal because they can end up like giving a um, giving a perpetual check with queen g3 and king d2. Uh, if the white king ever steps up to d3, then bishop e4 is just winning. Uh, with bishop f3 winning the queen. So that's not playable. And so this position is equal. They also need to, needed to understand what happens after bishop d5. Takes takes, queen b6. Uh, because if you take here, then bishop e7 just traps the queen. Um, and yeah, bishop e3, and the line goes on, right? Uh, they also need to look at what happens after the critical e takes f6, after which c4 is a really nice move. Um, I think c4 um, is possible. Yeah, I, I, I think I think this is the best move, but rook e8 was also calculated. After king f1, c4, yeah, you just include this useful move, a rook e8, to misplace the king a bit. And so this position is okay for black. And so we see that if black does not find this move c5, then, then they're just going to be simply worse. But once we play c5 and black calculated all of the possibilities with white castling, um, white themselves playing c4, white capturing the knight, white playing this move bishop a3, um, yeah, then they can uh, work out the position from there. So um, yeah, that just shows kind of how you can use um, this tree of analysis to uh, figure out what's happening in a complex position. Another way um, we can look at it is to compare the pawn structures. Um, so I'm going to be looking at two pawn structures here. The first one is the Carlsbad pawn structure. 
which if you've, if you've never heard of it before, happens in the queen's pawn opening, in the queen's gambit declined. Um, and after d4, d5, c4, e6, knight c3, knight f6, the main line is to play this move, c takes d5, the exchange variation, e takes d5 and bishop g5. And the point is, the point of the pawn structure that I want to show is that after this move, c6. Now we get what is known as a Carlsbad pawn structure. The reason is that this uh, position was reached, uh, this kind of pawn structure was reached many times in, an, in a tournament played in Carlsbad. Um, and I think back in like the some, like 1900, something like that. And white can play e3. After I want to put a, uh, I want to put a few more developing moves on the board just to show you uh, what I mean by how you can use the pawn structure to your advantage. Bishop e7, bishop d3, castles, queen c2. So white is keeping this knight flexible because it can go to f3, but it, but it can also go to e2. And after knight bd7, knight g2. So in this position, in this pawn structure, white can go one of two plans. They can put the knight on e2 and try to expand with f3, e4, which if black is playing really like correctly, then white should not be able to achieve this break comfortably. And so for example, rook e8, castles, Knight f8, very logical, just improving the knight to g6. f3, we see the purpose. We want to push e4. After knight g6, um, e4 is not really good because they can take and they play knight g4. Um, this is one of the problems. Um, and there are like some weaknesses in white's position. Um, and so that's not really desirable. So rook 81, improving the rook. And in this game, played against Kasparov. His opponent played h6, which practically speaking is not a good move. Um, it's still equal, but it allows this captures, and black can take on white can take on g6. And notice that the pawn on e3 is hanging because of this rook on e8. So we don't want to take on g6. However, white can expand with e4. And once we achieve this advance, it just becomes a really pleasant position to play. And he won, and Kasparov won this really nice game back in 2000. So um, instead of h6, bishop e6 actually just prevents e4 because if you play e4. Then this thematic idea of playing knight g4, trading off the bishops, and saying that this center can be actually quite uh, overextended. After bishop e7, queen e7, queen d2, preventing knight e3, c5 here. And so the purpose is that is that they want to break down our center, and if we ever push d5, then after the bishop simply retreats, this e5 square is now occupied, or is now free to be occupied by the knight. So after h3, knight e5, black is completely fine, and... And this knight and this uh, this square on e5 is just really a great outpost for black's pieces. And so that's uh, one of the ways that white can play. Try to expand with f3, e4 in this pawn structure. But another way is that if they put the knight on f3, they can play simply after rook e8, castle, knight f8, go for this so called minority attack. This, this is called a minority attack because you're attacking with one pawn, one or two pawns, maybe with a3, b4. Um, to try to undermine this, like, this pawn chain, which is, like, basically four pawns connected together. The reason is that we want to, I'll just demonstrate here after a few more moves, is that we want to take on c6 after we push b4, b5, so that the c6 pawn is a long-term weakness, and it's a so-called backward pawn. So that's the idea. We just want to take on c6. And so here, black typically plays a5, preventing the immediate b4, so white just plays a3, saying that I want to play b4 next, no matter what you do. One of the moves is like knight g6, b4, takes, takes. And black's best move here is to play knight e4. The point is after knight, uh, bishop takes e7, queen e7. But then again, why did she just b5 advance? And it's not clear how... Um, yeah, because if this if this like pawn on c6 is going to be a long-term weakness, or if black is able to generate enough counterplay to compensate for this weakness. Um, and instead, if they play a move like b5, then they, then they need to be really careful because this makes the c6 pawn forever weak. Um, and if this pawn is, uh, this backward pawn, the problem with this kind of position is that this pawn is gonna need to be babysit like the entire time. Um, it's possible to play a move like b5 if the knight was maybe on d7, so it can go to b6 and cover the c4 square. However, in this position with the knight far on f6, maybe it's not very realistic. So it's really position dependent, but we can see based on the pawn structure, white can develop one of two plans, play f3 and e4 with putting the knight, knight on e2, or play knight f3 and then go for this minority attack. So that's how the pawn structure can determine a strategy in a position. Um, another example that I want to show is in e4, 
uh, in the panoff attack of the Karakhan defense. After c4, uh, c6, d4, d5, white goes for the exchange variation and plays c4. Now, this is kind of risky because the d4 pawn can be weak. Let's say if they ever take on c4, they don't really want to do this because first, it, it does uh, allow uh, white to like get an isolated pawn. However, it allows the bishop to develop uh, freely. And so this is not really what uh, black wants to do. They want to kind of uh, say that the bishop needs to move out first and only then will I take on c4 so that the bishop moves twice. And so the main line is after knight f6, knight c3, e6, defending the center, knight f3, bishop b4. White can take on d5 here. And the critical variation is knight takes d5. If they ever take on d5 with the pawn, then this is just a symmetrical position with not, not much happening. Um, so after knight takes d5, bishop d2, knight c6, bishop d3, developing the bishop to its most the most active square, castles, castles, bishop e7, um, trying to reroute the bishop to this uh, to this square so it can pressure the isolated pawn. After a3, preventing any knight b4, bishop f6, um, we see that the pawn on d4 is actually really, really weak. However, White gets uh, like really good pressure on this diagonal with the bishop on d3, which normally isn't available, um, and also with this bishop on d2, uh, possibly having open lines if it ever lands on c3, uh, let's say. Um, and so, in this kind of position, queen c2, White is kind of um, like uh, trying to provoke some weaknesses. So let's say after g6 here, bishop h6 can come, and the position is. Uh, yeah, just continues from there. But more often than not, white is going to need to sacrifice his pawn on d4. Um, but in return, they need to play with a lot of vitality and like a lot of energy and just continue to try to create an initiative. Um, and so the position is really uh, complex from there. And it depends, like the better player wins most of the time. And so that's kind of what can happen from a isolated queen's pawn position. Um, Next, we can look at how we can compare positions with one move included. I want to show you an example from the recent World Championship match um, played between uh, Ding Luren and Jan Nepomneshi, um, where in game two, this position was reached after knight f3, knight f6, h3. A very strange move. Now, this move is known not to give any advantage because it's making useless pawn move. But Nep, I guess Ding Luren's point is that he wants to avoid any theory and preparation that and Nipomna she has and so he plays this move however it's not really it's not really difficult to kind of get an easy game out of this yeah white can sit black can simply take on c4 play e3 c5 challenge the center uh, bishop takes c4 a6 castles b5 and bishop d3 and so after okay we can see we can compare should we like retreat the bishop to b3 or bishop to d3 the point is that after we play bishop b3 and bishop b7 knight c3 Bishop e7. If we ever take on c5, then black has this really convenient response, knight d7. And we see that in this kind of position with the bishop on b on b7 and the pawns on a6 and b5, the knight would prefer to be on d7 so it can cover this square. Um, and so black has no problems there. And if we compare this position with the with one of the main lines of the uh, of the queen's gambit accepted, e3, knight f6, bishop takes c4, e6, knight f3, now c5. We reach a very similar position to the game, except h3 has been included, which is not a useful move as we saw before. So after castles, a6, now we can use this one useful tempo to play the move bishop b3. A very nice finesse. Now the point is that b5 doesn't come with a with, with a punch to the bishop. And so here white can play a4. Um, and we see that the tempo used on the move h3 can be can be like more useful on this move a4, challenging this uh this punch, this pawn um on the queen side. And so if they play knight c6, now we can play knight c3. Um, and the point is that if they play bishop e7, like in the previous variation, now we can take on c5, forcing the bishop to move. And now you might say, what happens after the, after the queen exchange? Isn't this just equal? Like equal material, equal everything. Yes, it's equal material. However, by by playing both, like uh, by not having a pawn on d6 or b6, I playing this move a6, you weakened all of these squares, uh, especially the b6 square. And so after knight a4, try and take advantage of this, uh, yeah, of the weak square on b6 and also hitting the bishop. Bishop a7, bishop d2, the bishop is coming to c3 and the whited rook is coming to c1. And white just has a, has an advantage in this position because the knight is gonna come to c5. Um, let's say after rook d8, knight c5 takes takes, 
Um, if black plays a, a bad move like bishop d7, then already bring the rook back. And let's say after h6, h3, rook ac8, uh, white simply plays bishop c3 and has the long-term advantage of the bishop pair. And this is really unpleasant. Um, yeah, uh, this position, this kind of position is already really good for black, uh, for white. And so black probably needs to play a move like knight e4 um, just to yeah get the bishop. But after rook c to c1, knight takes d2, knight d2, bishop d7. Again, white can make use of the weakened b6 and d6 squares by playing this move knight c4. And so we by comparing the position with the move h3 included so early, we can conclude that like that move is not very useful. Uh, they would rather be able to spend a tempo not on h3, but maybe prophylactically moving the bishop back to b3. Just keep the uh, fl yeah, options flexible. So that's how you can use uh, a comparison of like a move included um, to your advantage. Uh, the next one is to compare tempos used and tempos gained. Uh, we can see um, in two, I'm going to compare two variations, um, which will become very similar. Um, one of them is in the Sicilian, in the E6 Sicilian, and one of them is um, in the Kalashnikov Sicilian. So the main line of the uh, Kalashnikov is something like this. Knight c6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, e5, knight b5. And the point is that they want to win our bishop pair uh, with, bishop, with knight d6 check. So black is forced to play d6. If they play a6, then they're simply going to win our bishop pair. We're going to have to take if we don't want to move the king. And uh, with the bishop pair as a long-term advantage and this uh, square on d5 being weak, white is simply better. Um, so instead, d6 is the best move. After knight 1 to c3, a6, the knight is kicked back, knight e3, knight f6, uh, which is one of the moves. This can allow bishop g5. After b5, threatening b4 and preventing this knight from coming to c4, trying to make use of the d5 square. Knight d5, bishop e7, takes, takes. And now this is white to move, right? Um, however, so, so, so this position is like quite good for white. However, we compare this position with um, a variation after e6 d4 takes takes knight d4 knight d6 knight b5 this actually forces the move d6 right and after bishop f4 e5 bishop e3 knight f6 bishop g5 like oh boy this bishop has moved three times in the course of like in the first eight moves and this cannot be good but this is actually quite playable um after e6 i just want to show you a variation what happens after knight 5 to a3 if black doesn't break in the center with d5, uh, black is uh, like, oh, then white is fine. Uh, let's say after bishop e7, knight c3, b5, bishop takes f6, bishop takes f6, and knight d5. Now look at this position. We compare it to the, to the position we just saw before, and it's exactly the same. But the difference is that now it's white to move, compared to the position before where it's black to move. And so this one tempo, we can see that we would like black is already worse in this position uh white is already worse in this position because compared to that to the previous position in the main line of the uh like kalashnikov um yeah it's white to move so we can conclude that by going into this line white is simply worse in this variation after e6 and we go into all of these complications um i hope that's that's not too confusing because I got a bit lost there all to myself, but uh, we can see that essentially this one tempo that we gained um, or, or that we actually lost by playing this variation of bishop f4 is really not a good way to play. And so in this position, like white can play many moves, just knight b5 is just, is just not the best move in this position. So yeah, that's how you can um, use that technique. Next is thinking long term. So. I'm gonna go again to this variation in the Karakhan after bishop f5, yeah, h4, h5, knight f3, knight d7. And in this position, white can either play the move h5 in, uh, and then trade off, trade off the bishops and enter this position, knight g6, castle, queen c7. Um, okay, like bishop e7 and castle short is also, is also possible, but white can, black can also castle long with by playing queen c7, uh, knight e4, castles, this kind of position. Now we can see that the, the purpose of this pawn on h5 is to prevent any possible g6 advances because then we could just take. It also like clamps down on the queen uh, on this on the king side of the board. Um, but long term, if black manages to exchange every single piece on the board, except maybe the rooks, 
um, or maybe like they exchange the queens um, and have all of the minor pieces and uh, the rooks on the board, then they can make this pawn on h5 a real weakness by like possibly putting a rook on d5 and then trying to pressure this pawn laterally. So this pawn can be a strength, but it can also be a weakness. So white needs to be really careful. And so another variation which is possible is to play the immediate bishop d3. And so you're just saying that we're just going to get this exact same position, but without the pawn on h5. And so it becomes a really interesting uh, struggle. And it's debatable which uh, if it's better for white to include uh, yeah, this pawn on h5 or not. But I think most theory, um, modern theory says that it is actually beneficial for uh, white to include this move h5. Despite the fact that it can be used as a long term weakness. Now, next, and the last one that I want to give an example of is using preparation to your advantage. Now, I have a clear board over here, but I just want to show you that if you get to a certain level in chess um, and you understand and you understand the basic principles, you know when to break them and you can take advantage of your opponent's um, mistakes in the opening um, if they made like an unprincipled move, then you can proceed with preparation and really studying your openings in depth. And so one of the variations that I want to talk about is the variation in the Botvinnik semi-slav. So after c c6, knight f3, knight f6, knight c3, e6. Now this is the semi-slav defense. The thing is that if you want to play c6, you need to be ready with the exchange variation. Uh, knight c3, knight f6, bishop f4, stuff like this. You need to be ready to go into this like wholeheartedly. Um, additionally, after knight f3, knight f6, they can also play the move e3, which is another move order. And so black can either play bishop f5, bishop g4, or play the move e6. And so this is a variation that you also need to know. Um, but after knight c3, black also has to make a decision. Do I want to base my repertoire on the semi-slav after e6, or do I, do I want to take on c4 and enter the um, just the classical Slav defense? a4, bishop f5, e3, e6. This kind of position. So it really depends, right? But here, after e6, one of the uh, white's most critical options is to play the move bishop g5, after which d takes c4, enters the botvinnik variation. e4, b5. And I'm just going to show you without any commentary about how deep the preparation can go. e5, h6, bishop h4, g5, takes, takes, takes. Knight bd7, g3, bishop b7, bishop g2, queen b6, e8, 6, f6, castles, castles, c5, d5, b4, knight e4, and rook b1 are both moves here. Rook e1 is also interesting, it's possible, but it sacrifices a piece. And after, uh, let's say, okay, maybe we can look at the variation after rook b1, queen a6, uh, e d5, I think it's e d5, no, I think it's, yeah, d takes e6, bishop takes g2, okay, I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna close the a book here, uh, e7. Um, I think this is the move, yeah. Bishop takes f1, and here queen d5 leads to a draw, I believe. Um, after bishop takes e7, here, here, knight e4, bishop d3, knight d6. I think it's this variation. Bishop f4, queen knight b6, c4. No, this is not it. Yeah, no, so I'm already messing up something. <laughs> but yeah, I think I'm messing up something. Okay, so okay, so yeah, bishop d3 first. So yeah, you can see that even I, as like a pure Botvinnik semi-slot player, I already messed up the move order. And so bishop d3 here is important. Not moving the rook. Yeah, what I'm trying to go into is like knight e4. Um, bishop takes b1, knight d6, king here, bishop f4. And now that the pawn on c4 is not defended, uh, what can go for this perpetual? And so this is one of the lines of theory and preparation. But we can see that if black forgets what they're doing and just messes up one move, then they can get into a lot of trouble. If white messes up a move, then they can also get into a lot of trouble. And yeah, queen d5 is not the only move, which is a problem. Like king f1 is the main move. After which bishop b7, uh, I'll just close the book. Here, rook e8, not here, c3, king f, king g1, takes, takes, queen g6, threatening the knight on c2. Uh, and then it's like, I think, takes, takes, Queen e2, queen e5, queen a6, king b8, and takes, takes. Queen a3 is the main move. Queen e7, no, this is wrong. Queen e7, rook b4 is just winning because of a discover check later uh, winning the queen. So, yeah, after this move, I think knight b6, something like this. Yeah, I believe this is equal. 
No, even that's wrong. Okay, so yeah, in this position, queen c5. Yeah, okay, so you see that I already messed up, essentially. Um, but yeah, this position is equal, apparently. So that's how deep theory can go. Um, and yeah, that just kind of shows that once you get to a higher level of chess, um, preparation becomes a lot more important. And I've actually had the Botvinnik variation three times in my classical games. And so, um, yeah, against like not not like not even like master players, like even people like in the 1800 range, 1700, 1600, they even play this stuff. And so, yeah, in the modern day of chess, you cannot, uh, if you want to be really competitive, you cannot go without any like with just like no openings at all. So you do need to know some stuff. And yeah, I hope this video is not too long and uh, this is like provided some value to your chess um, or maybe to the students that you're teaching. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for watching. Um, I guess if you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below. Um, and yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Bye.